Proking mackerel, pompano, cobia, these things that are kind of, you know, off on the beach in the near shore, maybe coming in the inlet sometime, these things are taking a beating, right? And why might that be? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but these are some sort of life history correlates, okay? So if you look at the max weight of different species, and we look at three types of, of, of trends in the data, species that are still getting bigger in the tournament, species that are staying the same size, or species that are getting smaller, and we've lost those big individuals. These are sort of how the different species traits fall out. So where we're seeing negative trends in the data, those are species that get pretty big. Um, and if you look at the sort of typical coastal pelagic, it falls into this group. Um, if you look at the max age of species that are getting killed off, these species don't live very long, actually. It's not like your real old, long-lived whales are the things that are getting uh, decimated in terms of population size. It's things that actually don't get very old at all. That's not necessarily the best descriptor of the coastal pelagics. They tend to fall out here. If you look at the time to maturity, yes, those species are taking a beating, and that's the coastal pelagics. And if you look at how long they've shown up in fishing records, commercial fishing records, they've been fished for a long time, right? So things like snapper weren't always fished like really, really heavily. They were a trash fish for a long time and then became like a really prized fish, like 70s maybe I'd say. Um, and then I think this is pretty inter interesting too. So this is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. These are their vulnerability scores of different species. And the species that are showing the declines, on average, they have the lowest vulnerability scores, um, at least by one conservation measure. And that's where your coastal pelagics sit, right? And so there's, you know, pretty interesting, maybe non-intuitive dynamics. Last couple slides. Um, we talk about shifting baselines a lot, you know, the way things used to be, and, and you don't realize the way things used to be, and that's a pretty nebulous term, at least it is for me. But these tournaments have sort of brought it into specific relief. And what I mean here is this is a photo from 2003, and it is a tiger shark. You can see the bands. And I'm struck that, you know, like this kid, this, this is a big fish, right? This fish would scare me out of the water. It's my size, a little bigger. Um, what that kid didn't realize, and what I might not have realized, is that just like 25 years before that, they were pulling out 900-pound tiger sharks, right? And this tiger shark, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating, could bite this tiger shark in half, right? And so what role is that tiger shark playing in the ecosystem, you know, in terms of eating off the turtles or birds or other big fish that this one's not? I don't know that we have a good handle on that. It may not be important, but it may be real important, right? Um, and I just think that sort of shifting baseline thing, these tournament records are a really good window to, I think, appreciate that. At least for me, it has been. All right. So to uh, close up shop, I just want to return to that idea of press versus pulse disturbances. Okay, so I would call the climate change a press disturbance. Like, it's just, you know, it's just leaning on the golf for long periods of time. It's been happening slowly but surely. It's a press. Um, and I think it is having some impacts on the golf. Uh, the oil spill is a, is a very famous, highly publicized pulse disturbance. Now, depending on who you ask and what system you're in, uh, at least in my system, the, the system has just sailed through largely unscathed. It doesn't mean that offshore fishes or the deep sea has doesn't mean that some marshes didn't get whacked, but by and large, if you ask me about coastal systems, including most marshes, they've been fairly resilient to this really, really, really important pulse disturbance that we've uh, heard a lot about and has funded a lot of research. Uh, and then there's this fishing, which is, again, another press, and it's just kind of always there, right, and it's having an impact. And so this is a, a graph taken from an analysis that, that, uh, that I was a part of, I didn't lead, looking at how much armored shorelines there are in the Gulf. So at county by county levels, do you have not very much armoring uh, or not very much armoring, or do you have a ton of armoring? Good job, uh, Tampa Bay. Y'all are uh, on the, I guess, worse end. Uh, <laughs> uh, but at any rate, you know, like this didn't happen overnight, right? And it's not like this thing that gets in the news a lot, but it's just creeping and it's creeping and the armoring's creeping and it's another press. And so the presses are probably harder to like, whoa, like let's focus on. And the presses may require long-term data sets, which are hard to fund. But in my not so humble estimation, the presses to me are showing me more impacts than the pulses. Even if the pulse is really big and really famous, um, maybe that's an overstatement or not. And then the last thing, uh, this is my last slide because 
this is the obvious last slide for someone who talks about fish their whole talk, right? <laughs> uh, but this is a black mangrove in the northern gulf around the chandeliers. And what occurs to me is just to point out this. I figure there's some students there. You know, you might, you might be worried or people might talk about being myopic and being too focused in on your little study system and not the broader picture. Um, but what's occurred to me is, like, I could come here and I could work in this system and I could be looking about the effects of climate change, right? Because these things are moving up the coast, interacting with the marshes in probably interesting ways um, that are really dynamic and perhaps really important. Uh, if I was fo focusing on this system, uh, I can look at the effects of oil spills or any impact, right? It turns out the literature suggests that mangroves are certainly more sensitive to oiling than even marshes are. And I don't know of anybody who's been able to say what the oil did to the mangroves that have been creeping up the coast, if it knocked them back in any significant way or had no impact on them. <coughs> and then if you want to look at sort of the fish impact or the fisheries, like this is some sort of habitat for fishes. Is it as functional as a marsh? Uh, it depends probably on how much inundation there is. And I was learning today earlier uh, something I didn't know about the inundation regime of some of these black mangroves. It's more than I thought, basically. Um, and so, goodness, like you've got this one system, but you're thinking about all these different things. And, and, and not only that, but the Gulf is such a fabulous place to do it because it's a really dynamic system. And I think the money is going to be flowing to the Gulf for some time. Take advantage. Like, jump on it. Uh, all right, and with that, uh, there are lots of people uh, to acknowledge, like co-authors and technicians. Uh, I think libraries and newspapers. Most people don't do that, but I do. And then um, funding, and, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>